Hey, welcome back. I don't know what month it is where you live, but today is a crisp November morning. Just had a nice breakfast with plenty of coffee, which can only mean one thing. Quite the hodgepodge today, but we'll take them one at a time. Big picture, so you know what we're getting into here. I got a TIG button from Aaron over at 6061.com. Not to be confused with 6063.com, which offers a lot less copper and chromium. We'll be taking a close look at this amp controller, trying it out, super excited. If you don't know what it is, sit tight. Along with, I also got some more different silicon bronze wire, filler rod. Smaller diameter too, we'll do some testing with that. Some scrapyard finds, not much quantity wise, but good quality scores. We'll address a few questions about the CNC lathe add-on for the router, briefly play with that a bit more. But first, some quick thoughts on this Milwaukee drill. It stinks. I mean, it's great, but it stinks. Love-hate relationship, I may have mentioned that. Compared to my old worn-out Bosch, this thing packs quite the punch. It's quite torquey. In fact, torquey enough that you need to be careful drilling steel. If your bit binds, this thing will tear your arm clean off. Which is great, don't get me wrong, I love a good disarming as much as the next guy. If it weren't for two gigantic drawbacks. First, the chuck seems to be absolute rubbish. I mean, it says it's half inch capacity and technically that's true, you can fit half inch stuff in there, but it can't hold on to them. Anything over, I don't know, three eighths of an inch, nine, 10 millimeters. If you put any weight behind it, forget about it, it just slips. I just can't get this chuck to tighten enough. The Bosch, where has that thing gotten off to? The Bosch, no joke, I think if you over tighten the chuck, which was easy to do, I swear you could drill undersized holes. This thing, nothing doing. Maybe it's fine if you're using those kit drills with the hex drive end. These things, I'm sure it holds onto these just fine, but I've never seen a half inch drill with a quarter inch hex drive on the back. For wood, I'm sure it's probably fine. I wouldn't really know, but for metal, it's a nightmare. It's the only one I have, so I'm still using it, but it's a nightmare. Second, maybe this is still first since it's still a chuck issue. It absolutely tears up the shanks on my drills. Choose them to pieces. I can't get the drills back in the index without a lick on the belt grinder. No kidding, this thing roughs the tail ends up so hard. You could take your bit out after drilling the hole, flip it end for end, and use the back of the drill to deburr the hole you just made. Anyway, swapping this chuck has been on my to-do list since I got this thing. I do have a few drill chucks laying around, but before I break that out, let's try to remove this and see how it's attached. First things first, there's always usually a left-handed screw down at the bottom of these things we'll have to remove. Looks like one of those snub nose Phillips. I may have just said it out loud, but again, this is reverse thread. So left-hand thread, righty-loosey in this case. It's usually Loctited too, so it'll need a little bit of oomph to get that out. I just have to figure out what the next step is. I want to unscrew this. What I've got is an Allen wrench in the chuck. I'm gonna give it a good wrap and with a hammer. In this case, it should be good old fashioned lefty Lucy. See if I could do this without hurting myself. All right, didn't even need the hammer. Let me see what I got as far as chucks go. Don't judge me. I don't immediately have a good replacement. This is the one we just took off. It's factory chuck. I've got a few of these keyed chucks. You see some of these are male threads, some of these are female threads. This is the one I remembered having. Uh, this is a ROM chuck, R-O-H-M. I'm not 100% sure if that name still means what it used to mean. It fits, or it would fit, but it's a 3 8 inch chuck, 10 millimeters. I'm kind of stuck on that larger capacity, so that's a no-go. This one doesn't fit, but how cool would that be? I do have this one, a half inch, 13 millimeter import. It does fit, but it's a keyed chuck. I almost put that on there when I figured I could just take the chuck off the Bosch. And that's this one here, half inch capacity, the threads fit. It's got the crushing power to turn drill bits into black holes. Unfortunately, the size on the back here doesn't fit in the clutch housing. You can see it's just a little too big. Hopefully you can see it's a little too big. Starts the bottom out in that recess. I couldn't really use the clutch anymore. So that's a bummer. Until I find something better, I think I'm just gonna go with this one. Not the smoothest thing in the world, but maybe it's just been laying around for too long. I'm just gonna do the reverse to get this back together. Tighten that on with the Allen wrench and then put the screw back in. And maybe we'll give it a try.
I told you it's torquey. It almost hit me in the face. That wasn't a particularly enjoyable experience, but the drill didn't slip in the chuck. With the old chuck, that would have taken me four times longer. The other thing I wanted to try, and I apologize my mic powered down, the other thing I wanted to try was tapping. Taps, of course, are hardened, as are the jaws and the chuck, so things just tend to be harder to get a grip on. Here, the new chuck seems to be having no problem at all. With the original chuck, I'd be lucky if I could drive like a quarter inch tap, six millimeters. I don't know, other than the key, I'm happy with how that's working. I did instinctually grab it once or twice and try to loosen the bit like it were a keyless chuck, but I think I'm gonna learn not to do that pretty fast. I found a big old roll of bandsaw stock. It's not exactly the right size for my saw, but close enough. This stuff, you have to cut the length and weld yourself. Now, unless you're going through a lot of bandsaws, making your own probably doesn't save all that much money. I think a ready-made saw blade ballpark costs about $2 a foot for carbon steel. This is carbon steel. That's already welded and ready to go. Just throw it on your saw. Again, that's just spitballing, mind you. It depends on the size and brand of the saw, of course. But carbon steel stock, on the other hand, costs about $1.50 a foot. And you have to weld your own blades. So you're saving about 50 cents a foot. Again, depends on the brand and the quality and the size and all that stuff, but 100 foot of carbon steel bandsaw stock would probably set you back around $150. This stuff cost me somewhere less than 50 cents a foot. I mean, I didn't unravel it and count it all, but about 50 cents a foot. Truth of the matter, in the past few months, I've rigged up both my saws with tool steel blades, M42 blades. They cost a little bit more, but so far seem to be as sharp as the day I put them on there. I wouldn't be surprised if they lasted three times longer. I'll certainly keep you posted, though, if there are any surprises. But this stuff, if it works out, it's good to have around. And at the price, it was hard to argue with. This is three quarter inch by, I think, eight TPI. So eight teeth per inch. I won't weld one up just now. Frankly, I don't need it, and I just recently made a video on that, but thought I'd share. By the way, just an FYI, you can always use a smaller blade than your saw is rated for, but you shouldn't go bigger, even though a bigger blade might actually fit your machine. To keep blades in tension needs a heck of a lot of force, and it's not hard to bend your bandsaw out of whack or wreck your bearings by trying to tension a blade that it wasn't designed to handle. Anyway, what I'm really excited about are these six and seven inch mill saws. I really wanna try one out, so let's head over to the machine. I am so embarrassed. May end up with egg on my face here. I went ahead and I decapitated my mill, only to discover I might not have the right tooling for these saws. That's so like me. So let me walk you through it here. I can't use these saws with the overarm support. They're just too big. Now I knew that, and in fact, that's why I bought these saws, because as big as it looks, it really only has, I don't know, about a two inch depth of cut. The limitation I had with my other saws, once built up with the overarm support and enough clearance to get past these beams, these supports, although it gave me a very rigid setup, I wouldn't get very much depth of cut. You know, maybe three quarters of an inch an inch maybe, depending on what the pack looks like that holds the saw on. The problem is these saws have no key. Smooth bore. My other milling cutters all have keys in the bore. On top of that, the only tooling I have with the correct ID to mount the saw is for shell mills. These drive shell mills with these dog rings. I'm not sure what they're called. They engage on the back and then two dogs engage on the face mill. I'm gonna try this with just some spacer rings, but I don't know if I'll be able to get this tight enough to keep that saw from slipping. And that should be in the right direction. That load on the saw tends to tighten that bolt. I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you I was a little bit nervous. It's high speed steel. We'll be running it with coolant. I'm gonna do a first pass of only about a quarter inch depth of cut, five, six millimeters, somewhere in there, just to see how the setup behaves. Then we'll come back and try four times that saw thickness. Here goes nothing. All right, that sounded pretty okay. The saw doesn't seem to be slipping. I'm gonna to go to about three quarter inch depth of cut.
I am very happy with that. The cutting rate was a little on the conservative side. A little respect for the spinning saw of death was probably in order. What you're looking at is only about half the capacity of the saw. It looks like it could cut twice that depth. I did this in two passes. Rule of thumb is four times saw thickness, I believe. But at the risk of stating the obvious, you couldn't really do that with a standard end mill. I mean, you'd have to do a million passes, hope it didn't break, and would probably be near impossible to even get to this depth, let alone what the saw is capable of. I'm gonna to try to get you a shot of that surface finish. From what I can see with my one good eye, it's looking pretty good. I managed to find five in total, all with the same bore size. I think this is the largest my mill will take, at least the largest arbor I currently have for the mill. They're used, they all still feel pretty sharp, and from what that one just did, it looks like we got ourselves some new options on the mill here. yippee ki -yay, mother hoopa cup from the online Weldmonger store. Second to last, but certainly not second to least, I got a TIG button. I've always been intrigued by these, but they will set you back a few bucks. I mean, actually they cost about the same as a foot controller, depending which foot controller you buy, and effectively do the same thing. They offer remote amperage control while you weld, except instead of using your foot, you use your finger. I mean, I suppose you could use your foot on the TIG button, but that might lead to some hard to explain burns. Think of them like a gas pedal on the floor versus cruise control on the wheel. Now, of course, the other big perk of the TIG button is you don't need to kick your foot pedal around if you need to get around your work or your bench. It's one less thing to worry about. It's always on your torch. You may have seen this magically appear and disappear on my torch in the last few videos, and so far, short story, I'm really taking a liking to it. Here's what you get. At least here's what I got. A button, of course. I've just rubber banded it on, but that's the button. I think you can get sort of like a button hard case, you know, with some curvature to match your torch size. But I've come to liking it naked. It's much more compact setup on the torch. Then there's the brain box. I haven't opened this up, but I'm pretty sure it has real brains in it. A connector specific to my welder. There's a wall wart that powers the whole thing and some other accessories, replacement buttons. There are some zip ties, Velcro, that sort of stuff. Everything to get it installed on your machine. Truth be told, my first impression of this thing right out of the box wasn't super sunny. In particular, it uses a series of these small, likely fragile connectors and the wiring could have been dressed up. Maybe some overmolded strain relief or something like that. Although the cables are nice and small, they do tend to stiffen up when they get cold. I don't know, the whole thing struck me as more of a prototype than say like official finished product. However, in use, that has all proven to be a non-issue so far. The way this thing is integrated into your system, into the welder and the leads, really takes all this delicate stuff off of the battlefield. The brain box is attached to the welder. There's plenty of wire there for strain relief. And the button itself runs up inside of your torch cover and again can be strain relieved inside. The button is really the only thing that's exposed and it's got one of those Plasti Dip coatings on it. The heart of the amp controller is what I assume is a pressure sensitive button buried inside this rubber coating. The button you see sticking up isn't it, that's just a replaceable lug of rubber. There is some sort of pressure sensor on the PCB that's doing all the work. And bottom line, the harder you push with your finger, the more amps you get. Let me just get this all wired back in and we'll try some lay wire on some new silicon bronze. Now, the original stuff I bought, again, mostly copper, had 3% silicon in it and 1% Minnesota, I think. This new stuff has no Minnesota in it. Instead, it's got a bunch of tin. No clue whatsoever what the difference is, but it's different. I just have to be different. It's also smaller, too. In fact, it might be too small for lay wire, but let's try it out. In order to hit my minimum order requirement, I also picked up a CK Pyrex gas saver kit. Never used one of these before, but just between me and you, I've always been pie curious. <clears throat> the only glass cup I've used before this is the Fupa cup from Weldmonger. I mean, it's nice, it's kind of boutique, uses a lot of gas for the odd jobs I do, but it does get some serious coverage, no doubt about that. And speaking of Jody, he's mentioned on more than one occasion that the clear cups can help with aging eyes. Not that there's anything wrong with my eye, of course. I can still see through a piece of quarter inch steel plate at 20 yards, but we'll give it a try. See what, if any, difference it makes. So it looks like this gas saver kit comes with a wedge collet instead of a traditional collet. That's kind of nice. And the cup itself looks more like a classic sized cup. It's just a little bit longer than a cup for a gas lens. 
I've got some mild steel. I'm going to do a lap joint weld together a set of each, one with the larger original silicon bronze and one set with this thinner stuff, the stuff with the tin in it. It's not super clean. I hit the edges on a belt sander and wiped it down with some acetone. The torch will be set to 70 amps. It should be fine for the large filler. I'll just ease off on the button with the smaller filler and I think I'm going to try to pulse them both, manually pulse them. I don't know why this setup is giving off so much soot. I don't think I contaminated that tungsten and grind the tip clean just in case. That was a bit of a cold start. To be honest, I couldn't really see what I was doing. With this glass cup on the stainless, I had to turn my helmet settings down two darker shades. And when I lit up on this, it was a little too dark for my liking. I felt committed to it, and then as I started figuring stuff out, it arguably got a little bit better. Let's try it now with the other blend. This stuff is just disappearing in a blink of an eye. That looks and felt about the same as before. I mean, you have to be a lot speedier with the thinner stuff, but in terms of weld puddle and how it was wetting out, it seemed to be about the same. I'll try to just lay this in there and sort of force feed it from my left hand side, see what happens. You know what's really fun to do? Demoing my textbook welding skills immediately after everyone's been to Fabtech. I'd like to try this one last time, this time with the built-in pulser. I'll still be using the TIG button for amp control, but I won't be trying to pulse it. Maybe I should be taking babier steps. Okay, that was a bit of a rough start, but settled in pretty quick. Under the helmet, it felt a little too hot, so I ran the second pass. I don't know, maybe 75% of what the first side was. Just let up on the button a little bit. Whoever that was in the last video that commented and suggested lay wire plus pulsing, well, you were totally right. It looks a ton better. To briefly build on what happened in the last silicon bronze video, let's try to do dissimilar metals this time. This is cast iron and this is stainless. You're not gonna see this while I weld, but I'll flip it around. Let that cool down a minute. We'll try to break it. This next one I don't think is going to work just because the materials are just so culturally different. On my left we have aluminum and on my right we have aluminum. See what happens. Okay I have no idea what that is but it's a lot more than what I was expecting to happen. Maybe we're not that different after all. Yeah, we're different. This was the stainless on cast iron. Wow. Ended up in my trash can. Maybe that's a sign. Now I'm no meteorologist, but the way that broke is very suspect to me. See how it just broke clean through the face of that fillet weld? I don't remember which side it was I did first. I think it was this side. I bet there was a crack in that weld bead before we even hit it with a hammer. And this side, if you go back and watch bending it backwards, was a lot more ductile. So maybe this setup needs some preheat. I mean, that's kind of a big chunk of cast iron compared to this part. So I'm pretty sure that was the first weld bead. The pulse settings probably laid the bronze down just fine, wetted it out. I don't know, maybe it just cooled too fast, pulled itself apart. Learn something new every day. Okay, I'm all over the place in this video. Let me wrap this up by giving you a quick summary of what I think so far of this setup. First, I'm not really feeling the whole Pyrex cup thing. It's nice, it does give off a ton of light, and it's cool being able to see right into the weld puddle. It'd be nice if it were just a bit shorter. I much prefer to choke up on my torch, but not a big deal. The TIG button, on the other hand, feels like learning to ride a bike all over again. I'm slowly getting used to it. I am enjoying the thing. I've never really liked torch-mounted amp controls in that they seem to throw off my already bad aim. Like if you're clicking upper 
or down on a button or trying to scroll a track wheel, it tends to get my tungsten bobbing. As it is, I already have no trouble doing that on my own and don't need another thing to add to that. Though with the TIG button, I've taken to holding it in the crook of my finger. Sorry, I had to get this turned around in my other hand. I was saying I've taken to using it sort of in the crook of my finger in my grip somewhere instead of like an actual button. This lets me keep a good solid grip on the torch, but I can still exert pressure on the button to ramp or drop off the amps. Squeezing the button this way doesn't seem to compromise my control. Also, it doesn't take very much pressure at all to ramp this up to full amps. The machine has been set low for brazing, 70 amps or so, so I have a bit more resolution. Like zero to full pressure is no amps to 70 amps. If my machine were maxed out, the same pressure range would do zero to 220 amps in the case of my welder. In my limited experience, maintaining the amp setting you want isn't difficult. However, getting a handle on the low end seems to be, for me anyway. I suppose it comes down to needing more time on it. But that bottom end, I don't know, 25 or 30% of the range is tricky to hold on to. And when you're tapering off at the end, you really do need to let the button go. It's quite sensitive and more often than not, I end up just hanging out at four or five amps expecting the machine to shut off and it doesn't. Let me try to demonstrate that with 150 amps. I think 150 amps as much as this torch is rated for. I'll light up, go from 150 and try to drop it down as consistently as I can. I'm actually getting better at that, I think. Here's what pulsing with the TIG button might look like. As I've probably mentioned a dozen times by now, I need more time on it, but I have a sneaking suspicion I won't be sending this back. Since I wrote this check in the beginning, just a quick note on the turning attachment. This video has gotten long. It's probably pretty close to 24 minutes and 11 seconds by this point. But surface finish is coming along. When it comes to turning steel, every little bit counts, especially on smaller powered machines like this one. So the fourth axis used to be mounted on the end there. That's ideally where it would live. I don't want to pin it in place, bolt it down so it's nice and repeatable. That gives me the maximum turning length and potentially the maximum number of tools on the Z-plate. See, this thing more often than not will be doing aluminum probably. The occasional funny shaped piece of steel, but mostly aluminum. And I'm thinking ahead potentially to projects like maybe wood stocks or a couple of those leg lamps. Something where I need the entire width of my router. But for steel, that's maybe not the ideal location. That's probably the point of minimum rigidity. So the two rails are here. There's one here and one here with the lead screw in the center. The ball screw's on center. So just that change and moving to a high speed steel tool bit is starting to get a respectable finish. I'm still not cutting off a quarter inch at a time, but the finish is getting better. The reason I had the brazed carbide there in the first place was an attempt to break the chips on aluminum. And then when I moved to steel, I was just, you know, too excited, I guess, and, and kept going. Though in its new position here, I bet that brazed carbide would do just fine. Anyway, I think that's all I've got for this time. Thanks for watching.